When it comes to venom, every drop counts. No one knows this better than the funnel web spider, one of the world's deadliest eight-legged freaks. This is definitely one arachnid you don't want to annoy, since the angrier they are, the more venom they'll send your way. But why not just give the full dose out with every bite? Well, it's all a part of conserving your lethal resources here in life, death, and taxonomy. Welcome back to Life, Death, and Taxonomy. It's your 30 minutes of interesting animal information. I'm Joe. And I'm Carlos. Thank you to uh, thank you to Cassie for the creation of our theme song. To hear more of Cassie's music, please search Cassie Michelle on YouTube or Spotify. And thank you to Johanna for the creation of this week's artwork. To check that out, you can visit us at our home on the web at ldtaxonomy.com. And a very special thank you to our patrons, to Jesse Raspolich, Carol Raspolich, uh, Richard Kaspar, Lottie Aubrey, and Gray Hughes. Thank you so much for your support. It's greatly appreciated. Thanks for helping us keep the lights on. And today we're talking about a baleful beast that lives in a silken layer, but more on that later. It just sounds, I sound, sounds like I need to dr draw my sword and gather a party. Yeah. To go and take it down. You do. You really do. Um, but we're talking about... The funnel web spider, more specifically, the southern tree dwelling funnel web spider. It's really kind of funnel web spiders in general, but that's the that's the one that had a lot of the most info. Uh, we're we're gonna it's it's that's a long name, the southern tree dwelling funnel web spider. It's yeah. two hyphenated words in there. Get out of town. Um, we're going to call it here the simp <laughs> Um S Steady Brock. And the Funnel of Love. <laughs> My voice cracked there. Um, all of this will become apparent later. <laughs> Same. Um, <laughs> you're going to become apparent later. Hopefully. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I'm I'm not happy that the first thing I came up with included the word simp, but um, <laughs> here we are. You're basically Gen Z. Yeah, it's basic. Yeah, I've 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 devolved. Someone help! I've watched too many children's programming shows. <laughs> Which is a thing that people that that's a thing that people say. <laughs> that's, a, that's a way to. I've watched too many children's shows, and now I've uh, I've regressed, and so I say things like simp, and who knows? Maybe I'll even throw a yeet in there. Maybe I'll yeet a yeet in there. You don't you don't even know what I'm gonna do. So it's not that like it's not that you learn those words. No, it's, it's that, that uh, it's that I've you I, have regret. You're Benjamin Buttoning linguistically. Yes. I've be, I've become um, less intelligent and mature. All right, enough about Gen Z, please. Um, <laughs> let's at least at least enough about Gen Z uh, idioms. Let's taxonomize this. Okay. Should I? Do I'm that? waiting. Okay. Well, it's in the kingdom you know, love, and are in the kingdom Animalia. It's in the phylum Arthropoda. It's in the subphylum Chelicerata. The best subphylum, if you ask me. We do a lot of spiders. We're in the class Arachna, or, or Arachnida. The order is Aranae. Cucucanium. I just remember every time I go through uh, spider um, taxonomy, I remember that spider Latin name from Spider Man. In the one scene where, like, the lady's giving them a tour about around the spiders. Oh, and his uh, um, and his teacher aggressively says, "Like, I'm gonna absolutely suspend you and uh, hoist you by your petards if you say one more word." 
<laughs> Let's talk about how we listen. <laughs> uh, in for order is my Gallomorphe. The family is Atricidae, a war of Atricidae, or a tricky day, a tracky day. I would say Atricidae. Atracidae. Uh, the genus is Hadro Hadronic. Hadronic? How do you pronounce that? In N-Y-C-H-E? Niche? Uh, I don't think... Hadroniche? That, that sounds too French. Hadroniche? Um, yeah, I think you need to pronounce the E. Hadroniche. Ha, ha, yeah. And the species is Cerbera. Hadroniche Cerbera. Cerbera. Cerberia, actually. Cerberia. That's the that's the companion to Captain Crunch. Cerberi. <laughs> All right. Well, since we're uh, in the business of naming things, it's time for my favorite part of the show. Nitty gritty nomenclature. The part of the show where I ask you, Joe, a question, and that question is, what is the Translation: The English translation for the binomial nomenclature. Had Hadro Nietzsche, Nietzsche, I guess, called Nietzsche, like the philosopher. Um, Cerberia. Does that mean a thick nest guardian? B spiral web head. C dog-like gatherer or D spinning center band give me the first two again thick nest guardian and spiral web head and then the next door dog-like gatherer and spinning center band spinning center band final answer that is incorrect I thought that would be the one to trip you up um, I'm I'm quite Ugh. I'm quite proud of it. If I go with like the ones that I think it might be because of the word, it's always a red herring because you also think that I know, <laughs> also know that I will think that because you also know what it sounds like, Cerberus. Yeah, it sounds like Cerberus and guardian? like and ha- like yeah, guardian. guardian. Um, uh, and had hadron like the hadron collider, hadron collider is this big spinning. Like donut where they make atoms hit each other, so I figured like that was a spinning thing. Um, but no, it means thick nest guardian is the answer. Yes, um, hadron is uh, or ha- ha- hadro is thick or stout. Um, the n- niche or n- niche or however you pronounce it. Is like a nest. It uh, it is where niche comes from, like an like a a pocket or a nest. Um, and then Cerber- Cerberia come is related to Cerberus, which is guardian of the underworld. It's a Greek term. So there you go. It guards mm-hmm. a thick nest, which is, I mean, appropriate. At least it makes sense. It sure does. Yeah, so I, I heard Cerberus, and I also thought Cerberus, and I did, thought it was red herring. That this one was particularly hard to do. I, I anytime I searched like the Hydra Nietzsche, um, it, the answer was always it's a genus of spiders. Um, so I actually, <laughs> so I actually had to split it up and find out what each individual section meant so this requires me to do work and so this is my least favorite part of the show now (laughs) yeah uh now you know what it feels like to prepare measure up every week yeah but both of us have a mere fraction but both of us have to do (laughs) math for measure up so i have to do math but i also have to have to do research and history and think of something funny to compare this thing to. Oh, you love it. 
measure up is like half the show <laughs> <laughs> in terms of time. Um, anyway, speaking of that, do you want to know what it looks like? I do. The funnel web spider uh, typically has a robust, but well, typically it does have a robust body similar in shape to a tarantula, tarantula. The colors can vary based on the specific species, but they're often earth tones, like most spiders, brown, black, or gray. They have long legs that are agile, uh, each equipped with setae and spines. Um, which help sense movement and disturbances in the force. Uh, their eyes are tiny and arranged in two rows. There's eight of them, typical of the spiders. And they also have spinnerets like uh, on their butts, like uh, most spiders that shoot out silk for construction purposes. Um, that being said, let's talk about its size and dimensions. When we're thinking of a spider, we're wanting to know how big is it? Is it scary? That's yeah, that's probably uh, one of the most important dimension a spider can have is how big is it? And that and the LD50 for their venom. Um, welcome to the Blood Measure Up segment, the official listener's favorite part of the show. The part of the show when we present the animal size and dimensions in relatable terms through a quiz that's fun for the whole family. It's also part of the show that's introduced by you when you send in audio yourself saying, singing, or chittering the words measure up into ldtaxonomy at gmail.com. We don't have a new measure up intro this week, but that means we get to hear from a spider. Carlos has, can guess who it is. All right. It's uh, a lot of I'm options. running low on... Yeah, we've done a lot of them. Is it a Nancy? Who's a Nancy? Anansi the spider. He's the an old uh, um, like uh, an African fable about a, a spider that helps a, a lion. I don't know. Look it up. I've it's I've read it in a book a long time ago. No idea who that is. Um, but no, it is not that person or spider. Without further ado, the listener's favorite part of the show. Secrets. <laughs> and you're not the monster. No. <laughs> Aragog. You know yeah, okay, so you do know this spider. Yes, I, I'm a fan of the Harry Potter's movies, at least. So, yes, Aragog. Aragog. The Acromantula. Especially because when you play Hogwarts Legacy, you're going to spend a lot of time killing spiders. Unless you click the Acro... Uh, the... Um, Arachnophobia. Skip this game content because I'm too scared. Mode, yeah. Oh no, what they do is they replace them with something else. I'm, I now that I'm saying it, I'm. I can't believe I have not turned that on at least for a little bit just to see what they actually do. They probably just turn them into like people or something like that, um, or goblins or or what have you. Um, RC cars. <laughs> it just turned them all into <laughs> to Krispy Kreme Lightning donuts. Lightning McQueen. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's Aragog. Um, let's talk length. Between one to five centimeters, or zero point four to four two inches. How many funnel web spiders go into the height of the tallest point on the Sydney Opera House? Here's a hint: the Sydney Opera House was first opened by Queen Elizabeth II in 1973. I'm sure she. Built it with her own two hands mm -hmm. and cut the ribbon and opened those doors. She wasn't just sitting in a palace doing nothing. It is currently home to Opera Australia, the Australian Ballet, and the Sydney Theatre Company. I would not be surprised if she cut the ribbon, though. Yeah, that's fair enough. Oh, yeah, wow. Well. As a small aside, it's crazy to think that she just died, like, last year. Uh, I can't imagine being, like, a, a lifelong 
UK resident and like being there for generations and having her have been the queen for the for like 80 something for their years grandfather's <laughs> life yeah and then yeah. and then you're and then she's she's just gone and it's not like anything about your day-to-day life really changes all that much but like it's just such a, a constant since world war ii uh or soon after um and now it's just changed i guess that's the case if you oh. like for for any any country that has a a leader that sticks around for a while like i imagine a lot of canadians only know justin trudeau as their as their prime minister a lot of russians only know putin as their yeah whatever he yeah, is dictators <laughs> <laughs> um but to her credit she was at the sydney opera house opening was in she october of 1973 yes yeah I mean, if if you if you commission something, you might as well go look at it. Um, yeah, but it's like kind of like uh, George R. R. Martin wrote the story of Elden Ring. Like he doesn't even know the story of Elden Ring. He didn't know. He didn't. Write he executive it. He produced wrote, like, it. Some stuff <laughs> on a napkin and gave it to From Software, and they're like, "All right, we'll turn this into a game." Yeah, we're just going to take out all of the disgusting stuff that you wrote on this napkin. <laughs> and put in different kinds of disgusting stuff. <laughs> yeah, we're going to take all of the like human atrocities that you otherwise would have written into this and just put in an Eldritch monster. Um, okay. <laughs> Eldritch atrocities, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so the Sydney Opera House. I'm going to say is 100 feet high. This is just, I'm just not going to. It's just a good, a, a nice, solid number. Good, strong number. 100. Um, Six hundred. Six hundred. Uh, funnel web spiders go into the height of the Sydney Opera House. Tallest tooth. The tooth of time. <laughs> um, final answer? Yep. The correct answer is... 1340 oh it's 200 foot mm-hmm. tall 219 tooth. feet or 67 meters that is that is that is tall it's a tall one it's a little long in the tooth i've actually like i have no real reference for this because a i've never been to the opera house but anytime i've s- seen it, it's always just like a silhouette of it or it's like really far away so I've I, I've never seen like oh this is what a person looks like next to it, um, so it was just a it's a- ignorance on my part. I just got to go visit Sydney, <laughs> drat. I've never even seen a picture up close. It's always the skyline. Yeah, I mean it's like the most iconic building in the entire country. So yeah, and was built for them by another country. <laughs> <laughs> uh which at the time probably wasn't I don't know when Australia got no nah, was feels technically like yesterday. considered another country but um like they were the UK until yesterday. Okay, until the until the queen died last year. <laughs> yeah, and then and then they were free. Um let's talk lifespan. They live to be about 20 years old. Which is pretty crazy. That is a long blood. time for a spider to be alive. Bad. Maybe too long. They Their childhood lasts like seven years. They're like adolescents for seven years. And they live alone. Playing Elden Ring. Latch funnel kids. Yeah. Latch uh, how- <laughs> funnel <kids. laughs> How many funnel web spider lifespans go into the age of the city of Damascus? Well, I know Damascus is at least 2,000 years old. We'll start there. Uh, Well, here's a hint. Damascus is famously the city where Paul was traveling to when he had an encounter with Jesus post-resurrection and ascension, in which he was confronted for persecuting Christians and temporarily blinded. Technically, he was confronted for persecuting Christ himself. He said, why do you persecute me? 
That's true. And Paul had a change of heart and name. Although only he only he still had, he had both of those names. It's not like Saul in the uh in the Old Testament where he changed and got a name change. It's his Greek name, Paul. Or his Roman name. Uh Damascus is a mo- is in modern day Syria. It's always been in Syria. Yeah. But it's still there. <laughs> it's still there modern in modern times. Um yeah. So we're talking about when it was founded. There were obvious there were clearly like this is the cradle of civilization general area. So there were people living there for a long time. Um but like when was it like probably officially founded when did it start showing up in written history as a notable city called Damascus I mean I'm going to put it right there with uh maybe like what is it Ramses were the when Moses let the Israelites out I think the city was Ramses. It's a content. Con, there's a contentious between Ramses and another guy. I think the city was named Ramses, though. Oh. Um. So I don't know. But Moses was like what? Nineteen hundred BC. Uh, I want to say. That seems um, shallow. It seems shallow. Um, I know yeah, that, that the time shallow in history. The, the the time of the king started in one thousand BC. So I'm trying to just work my way back from that. Um, Moses was well, I don't know, but it's like 14th century, 13th century. So you weren't far off, I guess. Um. I will go with. I'll still go with. I'm gonna. Just, I'm gonna say four thousand years. Fine. The my answer is two hundred. Two hundred lifespans. That's man. That just seems like such a small number. <laughs> like two hundred twenty year olds back to back would make get you like, back to the founding of Damascus. It gets you back to like almost the start of civilization. <laughs> like it's uh that's kind of nuts, but sure, 200. The correct answer is 251.2 lifespans. Damascus was founded around 3000 BC, making it around 5024 years old. But it was inhabited long before that. Pretty much since, but like back to when we first, when humans were first like putting fingerprints on stuff, handprints on stuff. So that is a seventy nine point six nursing school victory, rounding up. Nice. <laughs> that was so barely a. Uh... Uh, a victory, but it yeah. feels like it's pretty close in the grand scheme. I mean, it is a difference of like of a thousand years, though. Like, I got I was off True. by a thousand years, which is pretty significant. It's one Elrond, one Elrond. Like not like less than an Elrond. I mean, Elrond was like right. Elrond Elrond was like twenty thousand years old or something like that. No, he's not. I think he's more like a Legolas. I think it was something like seven or eight thousand years old. I have the timeline in a magazine. I got. (laughs) (laughs) Uh. This has nothing to do with anything, but now I want to know how old Legolas was. Uh, I, they don't really know. Um, just like 
there's a there's a good guess for like Arwen being twenty five hundred years old. <clears throat> I don't. Know. Oh, really? Okay. Um, based yeah, on I'm like sure. the okay. based on the timing of Elrond's wife's death. Anyway, we don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> we are going off the rails here. Which makes it funny because um, she was thousands of years old when little baby Aragorn came to Rivendell and they became good buddies. She was probably his babysitter and his piano teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Is that weirder than, like, um, what's his name? Um uh twilight vamp tw twilight guy um um is it weirder than is that is that weirder than edward guy? yeah being like 500 and wanting to date a, t a 17 year old an active 17 year old um she's active. actively 17 <laughs> meaning she's she's like currently 17 uh no uh, it, well edward is said to have the like mental capacity of a 17 year old is that part Permanent. of the curse of being a vampire? Yeah, you're kind of like frozen in that time. Ooh, then suddenly, like, suddenly longevity does not sound that great if you're just, like, locked into the mental capacity of that time that you're, that you're given it. That's rough. Well, your highs are higher and your lows are lower when you're a teenager. So, yeah, but yeah. you're just bad at making decisions and risk evaluation True. and uh, but at long term. Least you're like really durable. You're also really bad at lo specifically like long term thinking and delayed gratification, which is something you gotta get good at when you live for thousands of years. <laughs> but, um, but let's get into some fast facts before we get into the major fact. Sure. Where do they live? They live in Eastern Australia. Um, and they prefer a range of environments, including grasslands, forests, and gardens. While many funnel web spiders build webs close to the ground, our tree-dwelling friend lives in trees or higher vegetation. Makes sense. Um, more on the venom later, but if you get bit, are you going to talk about what happens if a human being gets bit? Yes. Then uh, if you get bit, find out later. <laughs> if you get if you got bit right now, just call nine one one. Don't wait for the end of the podcast. Yeah, because all we're gonna do is tell you what you're currently experiencing. <laughs> um, funnel web spiders, uh, including spe the sp species uh, that we're talking about, construct silk r retreats, commonly known as funnels. Uh, these are tubular sheet like structures that serve as the spiders shelter and hunting ground. They're ambush predators. So they like to stick their little bodies in there and wait for stuff. The funnel is typically positioned in the a protected location like rocks or leaf litter or burrows. Um, and the funnel web spiders retreat. What retreat? I said that two times. Their um, hole consists of silk-lined tunnels leading to a wider, flat area resembling a funnel. Makes um, sense. And they'll wait at the narrow end of the funnel, usually hidden from view, and monitor the situation on uh, tiny little um, screens. In yeah, they, they have Simply Safe. Um, yeah. Until uh, feeling, the, they'll feel like sensitive vibrate. They, they don't have screens. They instead feel um, kind of like, uh, kind of like Andrew Garfield in the Amazing Spider-Man Two. Or yeah, the the Amazing Spider-Man One, where he like sits on the web and feels for vibrations. And then when the silk threads uh, send vibrations up, it's like sensitive little legs. Um, They'll quickly emerge and capture it and, and devour it. Yeah, that's the scene where, dressed as Spider-Man, he brings along like a camera or something that has 
a sticker on it that says property of Peter Parker. <laughs> uh, which I think precipitates the rest of the movie. It's like, man, that was a that was that was a pretty that was a pretty big uh, whoopsie. <laughs> Maybe he stole it from Peter Parker. J. Jonah Jonah Jameson keeps saying it. Uh, He's a menace, so maybe he's a thief. Yeah, that's uh, that's not the conclusion that uh, the our the lizard man our, comes our, to. our villain comes to, and it turns out he's correct. So, um, but that's all I got. Do you have any big facts? Sure, we're calling this fact mood stings. Let's get emotional spiders to all wear mood stings. Mm-hmm. Um. Man, that song would so not fly today. <laughs> um, Mood rings by yeah. Ryan, Ryan K. Uh, ab- absolutely not, uh, not PC. Um, <laughs> I was because I was just humming it today uh, when I was writing this out. I was like, man, now n- viewed from th- this lens. Um, it, I, I can see a lot of people being very upset by it. I still love it though. <laughs> um, so for the funnel web spider, um, they are one, some of the most deadly spiders on earth. Um, some would even say it's the deadliest spider, but there's a lot of different metrics to go by for that. Um, one of the major things that makes the uh funnel web ven- spider venom so uh famous uh is the fact that it can kill humans so where like a brown recluse or a black widow will do a lot of you know n- damage like there's necrosis uh, if you have an allergic reaction obviously it can be lethal or if you're you know immunocompromised in some way but for the most part, getting bit by one of those spiders is not going to kill like a normal full crone person. Um, but that's not necessarily the case with funnel web spiders. Um, untreated, you have a decent likelihood of not making it if you get by, bit by one of these guys. Um, it has on record claimed 13 lives. Um, but all of those were before anti-venom was developed. So going forward, getting treatment will, will pretty much, um, save your life. Um, Mm -hmm. but the lethality of the funnel web venom uh, stems from a neurotoxin in there called Delta hexatoxin, um, which, uh, is fatal to humans because it targets this, the central nervous system. Uh, basically, it attacks the nerves and causes them to fire constantly. Um, so they're in a p- perpetually activated state, which causes muscle spasms. It causes blood pressure to, to drop rapidly. Um, and eventually you'll go into a, a coma and then, there, um, w- and then organ failure, ultimately death. Um, this can happen within a few hours of being bitten. Um, and obviously it depends on the individual person and also the amount of venom that you are given by the spider, which we'll get into here in a bit. <clears throat> um, but again, anti-venom, it was, we, it was, it was a great invention. <laughs> um, so male sp- funnel web spiders are much more venomous than their female counterparts. I had to f- sift through quite a few articles literally titled toxic masculinity um <laughs> <laughs> so uh pray for me the uh um <laughs> the reason for males ha- having um more powerful venom uh is because all funnel web spiders eat mainly insects so they need enough venom to take down smaller insects which is not a lot of venom um, insects are, you know, they're, they're small, they're easy to kill, especially if you're a spider. Um, I guess even more so if you're a human, but still the, uh, males though, in order to mate, the males 
seek out the females like God intended. But um, the so the females get to hang out in their burrows, in their in their webs for their whole lives. Um, they don't necessarily need to venture out uh, and put themselves in harm's way because they're ambush predators. Prey comes to them. Um, males, on the other hand, in order to find a female mate, they need to leave their burrow and traverse the uh, um, uh, oh, who is the, who who is that voice actor in the da da deadly dangerous creatures? Billy Joe, oh Billy Bob Thornton. Um, <laughs> they have to traverse Billy Bob Thornton's trailer park. Um, to to find their soulmate, uh, which obviously exposes them to predators like uh, lizards, geckos, um, marsupials, smaller marsupials, uh, and uh, rats and birds. So to not d well to die less often or have a greater chance of survival, their venom actually undergoes transformation and it becomes a lot more potent so that it can take down these much larger threats than just insects. Um, and that includes humans. Um, and researchers have done a lot of uh, studies on funnel web spider venom because of its potency. Um, it's It has uses in pesticides, pharmaceuticals, uh, and then obviously anti-venom for treating, you know, funnel web spider bites pretty important in those areas um they've they've done a lot of research into the molecular complexity of that venom but they haven't done a lot of research into the spider's behavior in regards to the venom until recently so they they recently found that factors like the spider's heart rate and their defensive mood play a role in determining the proportions of the chemicals that are delivered through the fangs in the venom. Um, so there's a species, there's several species um, that have been identified to manipulate manipulate their venom like this. But there's one called the Border Rangers Border Ranges Funnel Web Spider, um, and they found an association or a correlation between higher heart rate and and more uh, potent venom um, concentrate, more a greater concentration of the uh, delta hexatoxin toxin or neurotoxin that um, in each like cubic nanometer or whatever of um, of venom. So. They make behavioral trade-offs, basically. If they're the, when they're um, because cre uh, ge generating venom is uh, a cost, and so everything in nature, like you have to, the these animals subconsciously, um, you know, both consume energy and expend energy, and for a lot of animals, um the metabolic cost of producing something like venom is sometimes not worth injecting it. Um, so if in a situation where it's not super threatened, but threatened slightly, it might use a, a less venom or a less potent version of the venom um, in order to save on the me metabolic cost of of uh replacing it um but if its heart rate is high if it's super defensive if it's i guess feeling attacked for real like it's like it's life or death then um and it uh it's venom will be extremely extremely potent so because it uses its venom for both offense and defense offense to capture prey defense to not be prey um, defensive venom tends to be more potent than offensive venom. Um, and the researchers are uh, trying to understand the behavioral part of this 
um, to make better anti venom. Um, yeah. So hmm. they are, and I know I said mood stings. They're not stinging you. They are biting you, but sue me. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's the, I've, that's all I got. That's, um, they, if they're, if they're feeling on the ropes, they'll give you all they got. You'll float like a butterfly and bite like a funnel web spider. <laughs> Interesting. But Don't so usually I think apply a tourniquet. Usually I think that, you know, whenever I hear like, oh, Australia is full of like super deadly stuff, like everything there is trying to kill you. Um, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's 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 just over overblown Internet nonsense. Um, this is one of those cases where that's not where the, it's uh it's definitely very real. <laughs> um, obviously, like there's a lot of stuff in Australia that is very venomous. Um, I think Florida might give Australia a run for its money in, ter in terms of uh, deadly creatures. Um, and I think that Central Africa would also give both of those places a run for their money in terms of deadly creatures. Um, I think I'd rather... Yeah, the thing about, like, Africa and America is that we have, like, extremely venomous snakes but and, like, small things that have a lot of venom in them, but also, like, predatory megafauna. So there's that. But in Africa, they Bears have both tigers. of those things. They have extremely venomous snakes, spiders, and also a lot more different kinds of predatory megafauna. Yeah. Like, we have to deal with bears. That's pretty much the only... And don't, like, get, to, don't get too close to a uh, bison. Yeah, but it's not it's not preying on you. Uh, in Africa, you have all kinds of big cats. You have crocodiles, uh, hyenas, wild dogs. It's yeah. Um, in terms of everything is trying to kill you, I think that takes the cake. Um, True. Australia is just fun to to meme on, I suppose. Um, but I mean. F T don't mess with funnel web spiders <laughs> uh, it's just it's different because like if you're sleeping in your house in central Africa you are not very likely to be attacked by a leopard or something like that but if you're sleeping in your house in Brisbane <laughs> you very well might have a funnel web spider in your in your bedroom with you so uh, definitely a different different kind of threat <laughs> Um, but that's all I got. You got anything else? That's all I got. All right. If you're out there in podcast, yeah, that was the fun of web spider. Head out from your burrow. Keep an eye out for lizards and birds and stuff. And hand out whatever toxins you feel like. Like the fun of web spider here in Life, Death, and Taxonomy. Hey Taxonomy Titans, I just want to remind you that we now have a Patreon. Patrons can see full video episodes and get shoutouts on the show. But ultimately, it's a way for you to help us cover some costs and get even better. Still, reviews are the best way to help us grow. So if you haven't left one yet, we'd really love to hear from you. As always, thanks for listening and engaging. Be a, be a toxic, be a toxic, toxic. Max, masculine, masculine. <laughs>